Welcome everyone to the 196th meeting. We had uh, regular and irregular meetings, so these are all just meetings now. Uh, the New York Linux Users Group. This is one of our regular monthly meetings. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, tonight we are going to be hearing about the programming language Rust by one of the maintainers and primary authors of its documentation, Steve Klapnik. And the title of his talk is Why Rust? Um, given that that's the title, uh, you're the ones asking the questions. Steve is going to be trying to take the temperature of the room. And so he'll describe how he wants questions and whatever as we go along. Um, but uh, it's up to you to uh, help him figure out the talk that you want. Um, I'd like to say how much we appreciate Bloomberg for providing us with this space. And thank you to everyone who's here uh, taking your time out. It's a beautiful day outside, but taking your time out to come here and join us. Um, tonight, before we get started, we have our usual requests. Um, first off is silence your cell phones. Uh, second is please do not eat snacks and noisy wrappers during the presentation. Um, if this means like pouring the snacks out into a cup or just putting it away, please do. It's very disturbing during the talk to have that noise there. Um, and the last is please use mics for questions. Um, just coming up, they'll, they will both be active as soon as we get going. Um, just this way people who look at this later will be able to understand and hear the questions and the answers. Um, our next regular meeting will feature Blake Metheny on open source at Facebook. The talk will be at a different space to be announced. That is the next, we are starting uh, the new space next month, right? Brian? Probably. probably. OK, so probably at a new space next month. Um, check out our uh, Meetup page for more info uh, if you're interested. So uh, I'd like to thank our, uh, the, our space sponsor here, Bloomberg, and uh, you know, acknowledge our other sponsors past and present here, IBM, Canonical, Brandor Group, Google, and O'Reilly Media for their support. Uh, in addition, Nylog would not be able to function without our many volunteers who contribute greatly uh, and have uh, over the years uh, and still do. Um, for announcements, we have the workshop. Please talk to Rob, David, Greg. If you have any um, questions about the workshops, they are going to be at the uh, City University at 138th Street, I believe, right? When's the next one? The 28th. All right, one more this month. And August is a break. OK, great. And so, um, yes, and I want to mention that uh, there are Linux distro DVDs out there. So if you have one that you'd like to try, uh, go see if that is already there for you. And you can just grab one and use it. That's for you to take, for you to try out, and save you a little time downloading or otherwise trying to get that going for yourself. Um, and I don't want them back. Yes, please keep them, uh, I guess, is the. <coughs> All right. Uh, Rob, did you want to mention? Okay, so um, quick announcement Nice Camp is happening tomorrow, uh, the full event. Uh, there will be sprints, classes, and talks all about Drupal and web technologies. And if you haven't RSVP'd, um, go to nicecamp.org. That's nyccamp.org. Um, it will be held at the United Nations from Thursday to Sunday. And on Saturday, there will be a keynote speech given by Richard Stallman himself, which will be live streamed. And you can also check nicecamp.org for information about that and see when the stream will be live if you can't make it to see it you know, in person. And that's all. All right. So um, at the end of the presentation, we will have trivia. Uh, Steve will be uh, asking questions. We have three books and three ebook vouchers that people who have the correct answers will be able to choose from. Um, we'll get to that again at the end. So uh, are there any other announcements, by the way, at any other community or, or uh, other events that people want to talk about? All right. Um, so everyone, please welcome Steve Klavnik with his talk, Why Rust? Hi, everybody. I'm Steve. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, I've not been to the Linux users group here yet in New York, even though I've lived in New York for about a year, and I use Debian basically exclusively. Um, so yeah. Uh, I'm here today to share with you this thing that I've been working on for the last couple years. Um, I've kind of made it this the latest project of my life's work. I don't know if it is my final life's work, but uh, it's what I've been devoting countless hours to for the last couple years of my life. Um, and I think it's really special, and I think that it has particular applicability towards people that are using Linux um, because, you know, the fact that you care about what operating system you run means you care about systems programming and 
programming Linux stuff. However, uh, one of the weird things about Rust is that it is simultaneously a very high and very low level programming language in that it lets you write completely ridiculously low level stuff down to like kernel drivers and in fact other operating systems if you, uh, you know, want to write one of your own. But if you're not doing the super low level bit twiddly stuff, it feels a lot like a weird mixture of functional programming and C kind of um, at the high level. So I have these sort of like two paths that I usually talk about Rust with. With, and normally it's very clear which one of those two paths that I choose. However, because of this particular audience, I'm not entirely sure which is the best approach, so I wanted to kind of gauge the temperature so I know which angle to take you on. Basically what it boils down to is there's the, I've done manage, unmanaged uh, programming before, like C or C++, or I am primarily a like Ruby, Python, garbage collector type programmer. So uh, who falls into the first camp, the primarily C, C++ people? Cool, this is what I assumed. How about C++ like 11 and 14? Are you familiar with that stuff over the original? Cool, okay. It's also interestingly about the split that I expected. Uh, and then who's like primarily Ruby, Python, JavaScript, high level stuff? Awesome, that's actually like relatively even, although you're like split out. It's so interesting how weird statistics and brains work, right? It's like everyone is super clumped for one and spread out in the, anyway. Um, Okay, so I'm gonna try to at least cater to a little bit of both of you, but I guess I will lean a little more towards the low level side. Um, <clears throat> so, um, okay, so Rust. Rust is a project from Mozilla Research where I'm currently employed. Um, I started working on Rust as an open source contributor because I was bored and I liked the language, and eventually I liked it so much I tried to make it my job. And luckily, uh, not very many people other than me like writing documentation, so it's very, very easy to be the guy that does that because uh, I'm like, I got a computer science bachelor's degree, but I almost got an English master's degree, so I am like one of those weird people that fits into that kind of niche, and so that makes it very easy to be employed. Um, so uh, I've been working for Mozilla for about a year and contributing for about 18 months before that in an open source way. And what's really interesting about Rust is that it's actually been in development for a total of eight years at this point, um, which is a really, really, really long time. And <clears throat> Rust has always had the same mission statement, like its high level goals have been identical over those eight years. However, the means by which it has accomplished those goals has changed completely drastically. So Rust has kind of been f about four different programming languages over those eight years. There's sort of like two year chunks where it's gone through these major like epics of its history. And I won't get fully into it. I gave a talk um, at FOSDEM this year um, about those particular details with those epics. But unfortunately, there were camera problems. And while they said that they got the main track on camera, the video has still not appeared yet. So fingers crossed, hopefully that's there. And if you want to delve into like the real history of Rust, um, then uh, you, know, you can watch that or we can talk about it later or whatever. Um, <clears throat> but sort of the modern era of Rust, or I guess the contemporary era, because modern does not actually mean present day. There's my English major going again. Um, contemporary Rust sort of uh, takes this approach that static typing can save you from all kinds of problems. So uh, <clears throat> Rust gives you this ability to statically detect entire classes of errors that were not possible to detect before or had only been in research languages where it was really like not popular or uh, able to be used very effectively. So a lot of the research that we've been doing is how to sort of take this slightly older uh, research from academia and make it actually in a usable practical language that you would want to use. Um, so I don't want to give you the opinion that Rust is entirely super novel, because it's not. However, uh, that also doesn't mean we've been doing nothing for a couple years. Um, so the... Uh, the, I guess there's sort of these, I described Russ as having these two angles before, but it's really more like three. Uh, we sort of have three camps of people that come to Rust. There are the C and C++ programmers, and I know that they're very different languages, uh, but for this analysis, I'm gonna say C and C++ anyway, I'm sorry. Um, the C and C++ programmers are often looking for uh, a newer uh, language that has new features and is not afraid to break backwards compatibility with the entire history of C and or C++, but also um, offers significant safety benefits without having to rely on expensive runtime um, problems. Um, because you know the reason you're using a non-garbage collected language is because you don't want to pay the cost of a garbage collector, right? So there's that group. The second group 
um, are, as I mentioned earlier, these sort of Ruby, JavaScript, <laughs> Python people. Um, and that's actually where I come from. I, I like literally have a Ruby tattoo. Uh, and I have a Pearl Camel too uh, from before then. Uh, I used to do C and then C++, but in like the early 90s kind of period when I was a kid. So um, I would be the person that would raise my hand about like, I do know C++, but not 14 um, originally. Uh, and so I've been sort of in the web space for the last couple of years. But when I found Rust, it sort of reignited the systems kind of like passion that I had. A lot of my friends in college were operating systems uh, like pre-PhD candidates, and so they were all really into system stuff, and then I kind of found Ruby and was like, I don't gotta deal with SegVaults anymore, whatever, screw this, and like went and built websites for a couple years. Um, but that group is very interesting and attracted to Rust because, uh, as we say in the Ruby world, Ruby is slow, but that doesn't matter. But the problem is, is that sometimes it does matter. So uh, Rubyists will say that they'd like to drop down into C when Ruby is too slow, but then we don't act ever actually do it because the reason we're writing Ruby is that we don't want to write C in the first place. Um, and so Rust, with its like strong static guarantees, provides this ability to uh, let you do low-level programming, but have a friend to help you along, which is the compiler. So you don't need to suffer through these like debugging of weird pointer errors because the compiler is there to point out what your problems are. Um, and so that's a very popular thing. The third group that comes to Rust tends to be the Haskell type people, the functional ridiculous type system type people. And uh, they are interested in Rust because we also have a ridiculous complicated type system. It is not as ridiculous and complicated as Haskell's. Um, we actually share a significant overlap with the ML family more than the Haskell family. Um, but when you're trying to prevent things statically, you end up coming up with type system stuff and the people that are into, into that uh, basically also are interested in Rust. Um, and so those are sort of the three camps and you can kind of look at Rust through any one of those three sort of lenses. Um, so. Uh, with that being said, um, I also didn't want to, I could like very easily give you an intro to Rust, like here's what the language looks like and here's what programming stuff is, but you can also read stuff online and I want to do what is most useful to you all. So uh, if you want to like think about it for a minute or two, I'm not sure like what is the best angle in terms of what you all want to hear about and I'm here to serve you. So um, if there are specific things that you're interested in, in hearing about Rust, um, I would like to uh, hear about them. The first thing I want to do, though, while you think about that, is actually show you, um, given that we are uh, in a Linux user group, I thought that I would show you my own little implementation of WC in Rust, um, because it's a nice little utility program, and I sort of have the uh, like functional-ish approach and the iter-ish iter approach, iteration, whatever for loops versus maps is what I'm trying to say. Um, sort of versions of those, and I want to show you what that like actual utility uh, looks like. So let me open that up real quick. Uh, okay. Because I figure real-ish Rust code is sort of the best way to dive into uh, what it sort of looks like. Assuming that my internet connection did not totally drop because It says I'm still connected. No. For two. Yeah. Turn it back on and off again. <laughs> when uh, when the stock exchange went down like last week, that was like half of my feed was people being like, "Did they unplug it and plug it back in again?" <laughs> uh. <laughs> uh, cool. It seems like it. No, hundred percent packet loss. Or maybe maybe I got to re. Oh, that's the wrong thing. Yeah, yeah. Is it going to make me do? Oh my gosh. Okay, sorry about that. I think, wait, do I have a local clone of this? Actually, might. Aha, I do, cool. I'm just gonna show you it in, in Vim. Um, okay, so the very first thing that I want to uh, show you, uh, this is, 
Yeah, there we go. OK, so uh, the first thing that I want to tell you about Rust, and this is also very applicable to a Linux users group, and I wanted to bring this up right away, partially because of that. Um, so one of the things that the Ruby, Python, JavaScript camp bring to the Rust universe is good tooling. So uh, the, the sort of modern, contemporary Ruby, JavaScript, Python tool set is very, very nice. Um, there are good things about it. There are bad things about it. But um, in Rust, uh, you never need to write a make file. Um, and that is amazing and wonderful. Um, <laughs> I can tell you that the compiler still uses make files itself, although that's in the process of changing. Right now, there's an open pull request. And I, I really like make. I'm not going to try to say that make is terrible, but I'll say that I like make when I don't actually have to use it. And then when I'm actually using it, I change my tune pretty quickly. Um, and so we have this tool in Rust called Cargo. It's not really required that you use it, although everyone does because it is better than writing make files. What it really boils down to is, is that Cargo lets you um, declaratively say what dependencies your project depends on, and it knows how to d download, compile, and link those dependencies in automatically so you just don't have to think about it whatsoever. Um, and that is really, really nice and works really, really well. Um, and so it's basically, I mean, we literally, uh, Mozilla contracted Tilda, who is Yehuda Katz and Tom Dale's company, who originally wrote Bundler uh, in the Ruby world to write Cargo. So in many ways, Cargo is sort of just like Bundler for Rust. There are some differences that matter because Rust is a statically ahead of time compiled language and Ruby is not. Um, and so there's some differences, but like conceptually, it kind of comes out of that era. So uh, if you've like used this tool before, it may seem super familiar, but if you're not, if you've not, um, so this is a cargo.toml file. Uh, we chose toml as the configuration file format because basically it was the least terrible option. We don't particularly like it, but all the other ones are worse. Uh, handwriting JSON is terrible. Uh, YAML is incredibly complicated, and in Rails world, we had lots of problems with YAML. I don't think I need to say more than that. Um, and INI is not really well specified. Who really wants to write CSV config files? I don't know. So, um, so toml is this sort of INI-ish uh, format. And so <clears throat> what you can do is you can list out uh, the only three things that are required are these first three, name, version, and authors. Uh, and it will, when you, there's a command to sort of generate this, uh, and it will get that information from Git automatically. So I call this RWC because it's a Rust clone of WC. Um, and then I put in uh, my license and some other metadata links. Uh, and the reason that that stuff matters is it will actually show up on the website, which I will show you in a minute. But so here, I can say that I have these dependencies, uh, and I depend on the doc opt. Uh, we call them crates in Rust, so packages are called crates. Uh, and so this depends on any version of doc opt, and then any version of Rusty serialize, because I actually wrote this code before uh, Rust stable existed, so you wanted to update your dependencies literally every day, because literally everything was breaking all the time. Um, nowadays, that's not quite that bad. Um, but when you actually do um, a successful build, which I have not actually tried this in forever, so uh, it actually does the dependency resolution, figures out all those things, uh, writes it out to you, you see this cargo.lock file. Um, that, so I said I depend on any version of these dependencies, but um, after a successful build, it writes out the specific versions, so you get repeatable builds automatically. Yes? I think you need to log in. Yeah, maybe it kicked me off again. Damn it. Um, Okay, whatever. I won't actually compile it. The point is, is that it will download and compile the sub-dependencies and then link them in uh, to give you sort of the idea. Oh, no, it's not actually going to show the right thing there. Okay, so normally it would show you, when I did dash V, it would show you this like gigantic, just like when you're on make, right, and you end up seeing like a trillion options. You don't have to memorize all those things. It just sort of does this for you. And the reason that this is really nice is we've sort of built in uh, sort of these default flags that work. So, for example, <laughs> you don't need to... Dash G turns on debug info, and dash O turns on optimizations, right? That's like pretty much true across every compiler ever. Um, so if you do a cargo build, you get dash G, but no dash O. If you do a cargo build dash dash release, you get dash O's and no dash G's, and you just don't really need to think about it. You do a release build, you get release stuff. There's ways of customizing those. I don't want to drag everything down with talking about all the possible options for cargo. Um, but it's just a really nice build system, and I'll talk to you about how that fits in with things like apt in a moment. Um, I'm going to actually talk about Rust code instead of just tooling uh, now. So, <clears throat> okay. Um, so this is kind of what Rust looks like. I don't know if this, is this, uh, I guess this red is probably not going to be the massive thing. All right, cool. 
Sometimes my syntax highlighting is really weird. Can you actually see that? Is that okay, or should I turn off syntax? Okay, cool. Um, some projectors, it's just it's just real bad. So, okay. So this is sort of what Rust code looks like. Um, I have this feature flag on top. I'm not going to talk about that right now. Uh, some use statements. I declare external crates that my package depends on, um, and then in this case, I'm using the doc op crate to automatically generate the command line interface parsing for me because I don't want to have to write that code myself. So I use a package to do it. Um, and so you can actually describe, uh, you know, if you want to count bytes or characters or lines or words, all these kinds of things. Um, and then uh, basically you make a struct. So these structs are basically the exact same thing as C structs. They're a record type of various you know, types of things. Uh, and so here I have like an optional string with a file name and then a flag for each one of these options depending on which ones you want to count with. And then uh, this is where I mean Rust feels like a little bit functionally-ish sometimes. So uh, I pass that string to this doc opt new. Uh, and then I call and then on it, which takes a closure uh, that takes an argument D and then decodes it. So this is sort of where like, I like to say LLVM is magic. So this particular interface, you're like passing a closure to another function and uh, you know, calling it. But LLVM is actually smart enough to, uh, to see that you're not actually capturing any external variables and then downgrade this to an actual function pointer and then inline it across everything else. So you're not actually paying like the overhead of a closure and then passing it around and boxing stuff and all that just kind of goes away. So you get this nice like functional feel with passing around higher order functions. but uh, unless you absolutely need to do uh, higher order function stuff, it compiles down to the same thing as like, uh, this is not a loop, but I'll show you a loop in a minute, um, what a for loop would be. Um, and then actually, I guess, before I get into this, I realize, let me go back to blah, 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 blah. Where is the, yeah, okay, cool. I wanna check out this version real quick. All right. Anyway, so um, this is sort of the thing that I kind of want to do, uh, show you about in terms of counting things. So this is a terribly inefficient implementation um, of this, but I wanted to show you this kind of like a map uh, higher order style before I showed you the like counts every single detail style. So in this particular instance, I'm checking to see, you know, if we've counted the lines flag, we want to check how many lines things are going through uh, or check the number of new lines, sorry. Um, and so we open the file and then uh, bytes will actually return an iterator of all of the bytes in that file. And then we call map over that, which again, if you've done functional programming, is the exact same thing as in any of those other uh, languages. You pass it a closure and it calls those closure on each individual byte. Um, in this case, we're calling this function to check to see if there are errors. And then we basically filter out every single byte that is uh, a new line, and then we count how many of them there are, and then we print it out. Um, and sort of the same thing with counting other stuff. So, you know, you want to count spaces or, you know, all those other things, we do this kind of thing. And the problem with this implementation, of course, is not actually the, uh, the map stuff. Um, it's that I iterate over the file one time for every single flag you pass. So that's terrible and it's very, very slow. Um, so the, you can do this kind of thing, but it doesn't, even though LLVM is magic and it compiles your code very efficiently, uh, if you iterate over something 10 times, it's gonna be slow regardless of like, you know, how good your optimization is, right? Um, so you don't have to write code in that style if you don't want to. Um, and so the, the head version um, basically loops through, uh, we do a buffered read of each line uh, and then count uh, each sort of type of count appropriately. So, uh, you know, if there's a new line, uh, we add one on, to, well, we add one for every, every single line. We add the length in bytes for bytes. We count the number of words and characters, and then we just print them out. You know, we calculate them regardless. This does one loop through the thing um, and prints them out. Um, but those are sort of like the two ways that Rust code kind of feels. This is like a very like iterative, traditional, um, imperative language kind of implementation, or you can do the complicated higher order um, shenanigans. So um, I guess, yeah, you kind of get, get both sort of feels out of Rust. And that's one of the reasons why it's a little hard to uh, describe what's going on. Um, okay, the really super unique feature of Rust though is one that it's like, difficult to come up with real world examples because it naturally involves a lot of code. So I'm gonna show you a sort of trivial example. Um, and I apologize because the, f the first reaction that people that work in C and C++ have is like, I would never write code like that. 
And it's like, yes, because this is an example. Like, it's meant to demonstrate a problem, not to say that it's like a real problem exactly the same in the real world. So the real thing and the, real, the, the thing that's like central to Rust and what makes it so unique is this thing called ownership. Um, yeah, let's get out of this real quick. Uh, I guess I just want to do this. OK. So um, Rust does not have a garbage collector. However, it does guarantee memory safety. And what I mean by memory safety is uh, the, there is no data races uh, whatsoever. So Rust guarantees uh, no data races. It also guarantees no use after free, no iterator validation. Basically, it's impossible to dereference a pointer to invalid memory at any possible time. Um, asterisk. I'll get back to that asterisk in a minute. Um, <laughs> And so the way that it does this is through a very thorough compile time analysis. So for example, uh, I'm not writing out the stuff that's in here because I'm lazy. Um, if I was going to write some C code and I wanted to allocate an integer on the heap, first of all, I would never do that because you would always stack allocate that integer. But again, this is an example. Um, I end up with some code that looks like this. Uh, you know, stuff. Um, and so, like, this is sort of, there's a couple of, like, things about here that, that are problems uh, that we can solve through static analysis that are not strictly required, um, but would be in the case of, uh, like, or we didn't have those kinds of tools back when C was made in the 70s. So the first one, he, uh, uh, the first problem is, is that if I malloc some memory, I'm required to free it. And in this particular instance, the operating system will reclaim the memory. You can leak this. It doesn't actually matter. Again, please just bear with me. It's an example. Um, but you need to have it one free and one free only for every malloc. So freeing twice is a problem. Freeing not enough times is a problem. It needs to be exactly this many times. And um, I will not tell you that I'm the world's best C coder, uh, but most people are not the world's best C coders. And this is like a giant problem um, if you're not disciplined. So the problem is not that this is like an impossible task that humans cannot do. The problem is, is if you slip up once, the entire house of cards comes tumbling down. Um, and so uh, dealing with invalid memory because you forgot to free something or is in the wrong place is a significant and pervasive security issue uh, in all kinds of software that is written in C and C++. Um, We've done a security analysis on Firefox, or at least the bugs that are open against Firefox. And basically, um, about half of the secu critical security vulnerabilities in Firefox today are due to memory safety issues. Use after free, iterator and validation, all that kind of stuff. Um, the second problem with this particular example in C um, is that I'm required to, to tell the C compiler how much memory to malloc, even though it knows I'm making a pointer to an int. So the compiler knows how big an int is. And also, you should know, I shouldn't be using int in the first place, right? Because like architecture dependent and all that other stuff. Um, although practically speaking is different than the standard and all that other crap. I should probably just be using like an int32 or whatever. Um, but the point is, is that I still have to get that right, right? Like, like the compiler may give me a warning or whatever, but it, this will like technically work even though it doesn't work really at all. Um, so the Rust variant of this code looks like this. Uh, actually, I guess it's not this code. It would be this, right? So this does the exact same thing, basically, uh, as this down here. Um, I guess I need my stuff. Um, and so what happens here is two things. First of all, uh, so box is a sort of term we take from the Java kind of like universe. So that's the first time I heard boxing being described. But a value that's been put on the heap instead of on the stack is referred to as box. You're like putting it in a box somewhere else. Um, and so what? Lisp was original. Cool. Uh, yeah. Um, I, I'm always. It's like it's like every single. I have this this personal theory that like literally everything important in computers was like done in the late '60s, early '70s, and we just stopped afterwards. So like every single time I don't know something, it's always like before 1975. That was when it was actually done, right? So. Not yeah, yeah. Not the not the type thing, maybe, but. Um, okay. So. Uh, 
I'm still going through my like tapple right now, actually. It's like, oh, man. Um, OK, so we create a new box and put a 5. And this will actually, under the covers, it will do a malloc for an int-sized amount of memory and put that 5 in it and then assign it to x. But the real magic happens with types. So Rust has this, this thing that's uh, basically the same thing as what's called affine types in the literature. Uh, what that sort of means is that Rust knows that x like any programmer knows, x is going to go out of scope at the end of this function, right? So Rust knows that it, you need to free that memory that's been on the heap. And so Rust automatically uh, calls free for you. So what the code that the compiler generates for this Rust code is basically the equivalent of this C code. So it inserts that destructor call for you automatically. Um, this means that you cannot forget it. This means that you cannot call it twice. Uh, it, just, it just happens. Um, and, of course, you may be saying, Steve, this is a pretty trivial example, and you would be totally right. Uh, the magic comes in with the more advanced analysis with more complicated types of functions. So, for example, um, I can do something like this. Uh, whatever we're gonna uh, I never know which way to go with this we'll just we'll just actually do this we'll do it this way at first okay so I'll do it that way, why not? Um, I'll change the name. OK, so in here, we declare a function, plus 1, that takes a box um, of an integer as an argument, and it returns a box of an integer back. Um, so that's sort of what the like type annotations and the little arrow means. Um, one of the reasons why we chose the syntax this way, and this is the thing I love coming from Ruby, is that you can always find where a function is defined by grepping for fn space function name. So like all of the function declarations all fall the same way, and that's one of the reasons why we move the return type from before the function to the after at the end, is because it makes things way more greppable. And I've worked in far too much metaprogrammed Ruby to know where any function is ever defined, so being able to do that is like magic for me. Um, personally, uh, I'm sure you with like that use things bigger than Vim like have great you know uh, static analysis or whatever for your language. But um, anyway, so so this takes this box um, of of i32 and we pass x into it. So uh, then we get it inside. We dereference x. We add one to it and then we return x back. Now you may notice I did not actually type return x. I could have done this, but. Uh, but it's sort of considered to be a little bit of bad style. In this function, maybe not terrible style, but like generally speaking, it's considered bad style. The reason is that Rust is an expression-based programming language, and uh, for the most part, there's some statements, uh, but it's largely expression-based. And so the last expression of any given block, including a function, is the return value of that block or function. So you just need to say x. You don't actually need to explicitly say return x. Some people really, really hate this. It grows on you, I promise. Uh, I come from languages where this is normal, so I'm used to it. Yes? Does it require a semicolon? Uh, it requires a semicolon if I do the return, but not if I don't. And OK, the semicolon thing. I was going to try to not get into the semicolon thing, but I'll get into the semicolon thing. So. Semicolons uh, at a this is a semicolons in Rust are one of those things when you talk about it at like a programming language level it sounds absolutely insane but in usage it's not a problem. Uh, let me compile this example first and then I'll show you because it's easier. Yeah, that's what I thought. So one other cool thing, this doesn't actually work because as the compiler complains about, cannot assign immutable box content um, asterisk x. So the problem here is that, and the problem, I mean by problem is awesome, Rust defaults to immutability for everything. So you have to explicitly opt into immutability by annotating stuff. So in this particular instance, we've not said that we can actually uh, change this value. So I think that I need this mute here, and I do. Um, it complains that we haven't used, excuse me, used the y variable at all, which makes sense. Um, but whatever, this compiles. OK, so if we put a semicolon here, then Rust will error with a completely different error. Um, not all control paths return a value. Um, oh, man. 
Okay, so in most instances, Rust will also say, try removing the semicolon here. But in this instance, it doesn't. So our diagnostics must not be picking this up for some reason. But basically, what it boils down to is, is that the semicolon is a statement terminator, and statements evaluate to the unit type, like an empty tuple. So that's a mismatch type from the empty tuple return value to the box return value. And so it's like complaining like, oh, the unit return type is not really returning anything, so you've got a problem here with types. Um, and so when it's just an expression on its own, it's no big deal. Um, Yeah, the, I'll repeat it for the, the yeah. thing. The if question is basically though, like, why does it not complain about a type mismatch? Last time I showed off this example, it did complain that it was a type mismatch. So there must be something weird with the diagnostic. I'm gonna go home and file a bug about this particular example because it should. Um, I think that that's because we sort of unified the idea of, uh, of uh, the unit type being the same as no return. And so it's defaulting to like this. This is why it says not all control paths return a value is because it's treating returning an empty tuple as not actually returning anything, which is one way of looking at it, but I think it makes for a worse error message. So cool. Um, <laughs> anyway. Um, and so the, the, thing, the thing I really want to talk about with this example, though, is this, this idea of when the memory gets freed. So uh, you'll also notice that we have to return this box back out. And the reason why is that, as I told you, when variables go out of scope, Rust automatically inserts the free. So if we didn't try, if we didn't return the box here, and we just tried to update it, um, and then let's say to, to actually observe this behavior... Oh, I can't type at all. Um, we don't use C style formatting stuff. We use Python style printf formatting stuff. So the double curly things are like insert the value here and you can put formatting options between the curlies. But um, so this will print out the value of X. So in this case, um, this would be a use after free, right? Is that what you're gonna say? Or you're gonna say something else? We might want to start batching up questions because I don't want to like constantly interrupt the things, but one yeah, more. I just guess. noticing that that it seems kind of inconsistent. You got a star x, which is being treated as an L value, and then you've said mut x and x. I'm thinking is sort of like a pointer, really, and but then you're using println, and there, now you're not using it as if it was a pointer. Right. Uh, so. Anyway, that's this is kind of in the weeds, so I guess what I'll just say is println knows that you don't want to print out the value. It knows you want to print out the value and not actually the pointer itself, so it dereferences it automatically. That's the reason why. The mutt is due to pattern matching, which I'll talk to later, so we'll just like hand wave over that as being slightly weird for now. Um, but that's basically these two things. Oh, these two things are equivalent, basically, is it'll like dereference it as a pointer type. Um, unless you put in the I want to print out a pointer format, format string, and then it won't do the dereferencing. Um, Okay, so in here, I told you that when the variable goes out of scope, uh, Rust would insert a free. So when we pass in the value of x, uh, that means that x would go here, and at the end of this, Rust would insert a free here, right? Because x now goes out of scope. So then we would return, that value of x would be like, it, it's already gone away, and so this is now invalid. So that's actually exactly what the Rust compiler will complain to you about, uh, use of move value x. So Rust is able to know that like, hey, you gave away x to this other function, and so it didn't give you it back. So it's going to be responsible for freeing this memory, and so you can't use it. So this turns this use after free bug into a compile time error instead of a runtime error. Um, and so it would be really, really annoying if, uh, I guess I typed too much since then, I'll just do this. Uh, this does actually work. This works just fine. So we now return that value back. And so it's not really going out of scope anymore and that it's being returned and we're assigning it to a new value y. And so in this case, Rust compiles this no problem and it's happy. Um, so this is sort of Excuse where me, the previous. Would it be problematic if you, if you pass two box, boxed uh, variables in, are you supposed to return both? Uh, yeah, so, so there is, this is kind of related to what I was gonna say, yeah. So there's, there's sort of a problem here in that, um, and this is, to my understanding, where the literature about this sort of technique uh, sort of fell down. This is called like memory regions or affine, affine types is broader, but this is how it's implemented with affine types. Um, 
the problem here is that when you pass things to functions, you very often don't want them to go away forever after that function is done, right? It's kind of like a terrible, it's not really how you write code. When you pass things to functions, you usually want those functions to do something to the value, but then you want to be able to use them afterwards. So um, we call this concept in Rust ownership. So we say that each value owns the, the data that it's pointed to. And when you own something, you can destroy it if you want, right? Because you're the owner. Uh, I'm like making a physical analogy here. but. It's not fun if you are the only one that gets to use things that you own. So what you do with real world things is you lend them to other people, right? So like I could lend you uh, this pen, and like you can't destroy it unless you're a jerk uh, <laughs> before you give it back to me, right? So Rust has this concept called borrowing that basically means that you don't need to actually like return everything because as the question basically boiled down to, if I start passing, if I pass three boxes to the function, what am I have to return three of these boxes? So, like you could do that. Like you could you could you could like return a tuple of like three boxes here, but that would just get really unwieldy really quickly. So since this is a really common pattern, Rust includes a syntax and semantics for this thing called borrowing, and what that lets you do. Uh, I'm just going to get rid of this. I'm just going to make this a dummy implementation because, uh, you know, whatever. I don't want to deal with this mute shenanigans anymore. It's going to cause more problems than it's worth. Um, so if I take a reference to an I32 with an ampersand instead of the box, a reference says, hey, I would like to borrow this value from you, but I don't want to keep it forever. I just want to be able to use it for a little while, and then you can have it back. So what happens here? is that I believe that with like coercions, this will just actually work. I'm going to type it, and maybe it won't actually just work, and we'll see what happens. That's what I love about Rust is it lets me be lazy, because I'm just like, I'm going to try this and see if the compiler yells at me. Yeah, cool, that's what I thought. Box, yeah. OK, so what we have to actually do is uh, the value x is in a box. So we have to dereference that box to get the value. But then we want to pass a reference to that value in. So we end up, well. We end up creating a new reference to it, which to a C or C++ programmer, this looks like a no-op, but it's not actually in that it's like unwrapping it out of the box and giving you a, an integer, and then taking a reference to that integer and passing it in. So this now works just fine, and it will actually, uh, if, I, if I did like run this, I'm just compiling it, uh, it, would, uh, it would work and print out the value. But so because I'm taking this box and I'm temporarily passing ownership, I'm letting it borrow, uh, letting plus one borrow my integer, uh, everything is just fine, and I don't need to worry about returning ownership and all that kind of stuff. So this is sort of the like key thing that enforces Rust safety, is this ability to temporarily lend out values and know who is responsible for freeing the memory all at compile time. So this, I'll let you get it one second. I want to emphasize that all of this stuff is compile time analysis. You pay no runtime overhead for any of this, and this basically compiles down to a regular old C pointer uh, that just has had all these invariants checked when it's compiled. Yes. So the error, the warning that you got was that you passed x into the function and you didn't use it. I didn't it. use it ever, okay. yeah. That was, that was what the error was. Uh, so this is kind of the, the root of what Rust does to, uh, to ensure this kind of safety. Um, and uh, also this mutability, immutability thing is very central to it as well. So whew, um, the other thing is this is all immutable stuff, right? So it doesn't actually matter. I could, uh, I could call this like a bunch of times, and it would be totally fine. Um, because at the end of every function, it's giving back that ownership back, and we can use it again and again, um, and that's fine. But yes. So what, the question is, what would happen if I pass in a reference to the box instead of the integer inside the box? I could totally do that actually. So this this does work. And that's fine. The difference is, uh, and you're, this is a great question because I should have explained this, is basically that um, this is less general than the previous function. So because this requires that I have something in a box, if I had a different type, so say, for example, I also had uh, a, I'm just going to type the whole path out because uh, say I also had a reference counted five with the RC type. Um, if I have a reference counted value, uh, then I couldn't use this plus one function because it takes a box and a box only. But if I take a reference to the i32 itself, I could do the exact same thing uh, 
unwrap this from the reference counted value uh, and then pass in a, a borrow to it, and that would work with both functions. So we tend to, uh, Rust programmers tend to express things in terms of like borrowing the underlying type rather than relying on the specific like container pointer thing, basically. Um, yes, yeah, so it'd be X and Y, sorry. Yeah, like that. Um, so it's, it's more general if you express things as a borrowed type rather than the specific um, own type. Yes. You mentioned that uh, mutability and immut immutability is very important. Yes. So before you deleted all the code in plus one, you had it set to uh, mut, and that let it, you said it was mutable there, but x wasn't declared as mutable in main. So yes. how does, can you go yes. a little bit of that? I will, I will go over this. So mutability in Rust is interesting. We actually had an entire discussion um, about changing the, all of the terminology relating to mutability versus immutability. Uh, we called this the mute apocalypse. It was one of the largest arguments in Rust design history. Uh, and that's basically because, as it turns out, um, if you're trying to ensure data race safety, which we are because data races are bad, um, mutability and uh, ownership are two sides of the same coin. So this is like called the, the read-write lock pattern, basically. So this is safe. So if you have n references, references to an immutable thing. So you can have as many references as you want to something that's immutable. There's no problems there, right? You just read only from a value. Or you can have one reference to an immutable thing. So if you have only one reference to something, you can change it all you want, and you're not going to cause any problems with anybody else. But once you start having aliasing and mutability together at the same time, that's when you start introducing problems. So we have this choice. We could either talk about these things in the terms of mutability and immutability, or we could talk about it in the terms of shared versus exclusive and, or unique. Um, and so we decided to do mutable immutability. Um, and I still think that's a better thing because programmers are more comfortable with immutable versus immutability. Uh, when, we, when we first, when someone suggested that we remove the concept of mutable versus immutable by default from Rust, I got real mad until I thought about it for a while. And so I think ultimately it's like the better way to talk about it, but they're really equivalent, basically. Um, shared versus unique, mutable versus immutable, when you get down to it. So following those rules, um, if you, I'm actually, I actually am going to delete lots of this stuff. I'll leave this down here, but. So, if we have a five, stack allocated five, um, we can't do anything to change this value. It's, it's immutable. However, um, X is a binding to this value of five, like in, in the sense that uh, in like the way the functional programmers think about it, the name X is associated with this particular memory location. And so I can, I can make five mutable in two different ways, and they mean two different things. So putting a mute here means that I'm making the binding mutable, but the value the binding points to is immutable. So in this case, I can say X equals six, and I'm changing what X is pointing to, and that's okay, or not pointing to, but like referring to, and that's okay. Um, but I can't change the memory location that X is currently pointing to, if that makes any sense. So I can like divert it to a different one, but I can't modify it in place. Um, I could also have an immutable binding, so it's only able to point to one memory location and it doesn't change, but I can make a mutable pointer to that location in memory. And now I'm able to change what that location, like the value in that location in memory, what it is, but I'm not able to make this particular X point to a different memory location. So those are two different things. You can also combine them if you want, which I've basically never seen ever used in the real world ever. Uh, and now X is a value that can point at different locations in memory and it, it is pointing at a, a mutable location in memory where I'm allowed to change those things. Uh, and so that's sort of the difference. And so in this particular instance, uh, the reason that this is mute X and not like, even though X is not actually mutable uh, here, is because this kind of mutability is a property of the binding itself, not of the memory location that it's at. And so even though 
even though this is like this, and then I called plus one, and I passed in, uh, I guess this was a box. Even though I passed in this x here, uh, this mute x affects the binding of the function argument. And so I'm allowed to change uh, I'm allowed to change it in that particular moment. And so what, this is basically doing the same thing as like x, uh, or brains, this is asterisk x equals five is the same as let underscore x equal five, and then let, or asterisk x equals underscore x. So it's sort of like two options. So I'm really, or this rather. So I'm really like changing where x is pointing to when I do that star equals or whatever. And so that's kind of like why that particularly works. Because it's a value of the, of the binding at that given time. And it can change over time. So Rust also supports shadowing for names, sort of like a, so Rust was originally implemented in OCaml. So we share a lot of similar things with OCaml. So I actually like, I can do, I guess I shouldn't have copied that. This. This is actually legal um, because I can shadow the old X with a new X and change the property of the binding. So here the binding goes back and forth between mutable and immutable. Again, this is like a thing that falls out of the rules that is not actually really useful or used in the language itself, but it's just like a, a symptom of the way that the rules work. Um, before I dig more into these details, the last thing I want to say briefly uh, about this this rule with mutability and sort of why I want to mention it is, while this is true for data races in a single threaded context, if you think about it, this is also the rules you need to have thread safety in a multi-threaded or multi-process context, right? So this is the same kind of lock that you would implement um, if you were doing those kinds of things. And so Rust is able to give you a, a ridiculous degree of thread safety uh, because it knows these rules about what is mutable and is what is able to be um, aliased, because sort of like threading is basically like aliasing on steroids because it starts messing with time, right? Um, and so uh, Rust is actually able to give you compile time errors about your thread safety problems, which is super intense and super cool. So. Um, I was going to say, maybe I should start talking about that, or maybe I should switch into some other aspect of Rust entirely. I don't know what's useful, because I was asking for your feedback earlier. So what's up? What do you think? Uh, just one myth. Uh, it's actually n, n immutable references to a thing that could be mutable. Yes. One mutable reference to that thing it might be mutable. <coughs> right. Yes, thank you. The mutability should be on the reference, not on the thing. You're, you're correct. What's up? Uh, yeah. Uh, earlier in the beginning of the talk, you mentioned the uh, concept of people saying, I want to write um, you know, a Ruby extension or a, a Python extension. Yeah. Um, is there a, uh, does this output C compatible code, object code? And is there like a standard practice for like, I want to make a Python extension using Rust? So um, basically what you do is, if I want to make plus one accessible, uh, from something external, I can just add extern and then a no mangle attribute. And now this will use the C ABI uh, and expose this in that way. So with that, you can then bind uh, to uh, this from Ruby or Python or whatever. Um, and I actually have documentation about that in the official Rust book. There's a chapter called Embedding Rust in Other Languages, where I show a little tiny Rust function and then uh, call it from Ruby, Python, and Node um, using this FFI. So, uh, and a big part of this is the fact that Rust does not have a runtime, or at least it has a runtime of the equivalent size of like C's runtime. It is very, very tiny. And so embedding Rust in other languages is like ridiculously trivial and not a problem because you basically spit out a self contained um, shared object. So, yeah. Can you embed C in Rust? Yes. So you can do the same thing in the other direction. Uh, you can uh, bind to uh, a C function and then call into Rust, call into the C from Rust the same way. Yeah. What's up? Hi. Um, <clears throat> how do you uh, typecast X to another type, like double or long? Yeah. So um, in this instance, uh, 
Rust has, so with type, we have really good type inference in Rust, but you'll be noticed that I've written, I've written types in places like here, right? So in my function declaration, I wrote this was an I32. Um, and so what we sort of decided after, after looking at what other languages do that have full program inference, even those languages generally recommend that you write func func types in function signatures because that significantly helps in debugging because if you let it infer the type of your function, you get weird errors at a distance. And then I remembered when I was doing Haskell in college and like that was a super big problem for me. Um, I, I like to joke that like doing Haskell in college is like the new doing LSD in college, right? You're like, whoa, you're sitting in your room and you're like, my mind is blown. Um, so uh, maybe not the new exactly, but um, anyway, the point is, is that if you wanted it, so this five is then inferred to be an I32 specifically because I, uh, I passed it to a function that was expecting an I32. So if I wanted five or the box to be, uh, let's say a U64, then uh, I could make this function be that way, and the five would get inferred in the other direction. Um, if I if I wanted to annotate it so that it was expressly a five u sixty four, I could say five as u sixty four, um, or I could also say five u sixty four, and that works. Um, and then finally, if I wanted to write out the actual full type, I could actually over here say colon box, uh, you know, u sixty four. And uh, that would also like cause the inference to work um, in whatever particular way that you want. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. One other thing that we've done with regards to inference is that uh, this is always an integral type, but this is always a floating point type. So we won't do that kind of inference where a five without the dot could be an F64. It will throw a value saying like you're using an integral value as a float value. You need to do the dot or a dot zero, um, and we think that's a good thing. We'll see as time goes on. Occasionally, people pop up and they're like, why isn't this 5 a float? Because 5 is a totally valid float value. And you're like, well, 5.0 would be a better float value because uh, it looks like a float, right? So what's up? So I see you use box over there. So what exactly is that box statement? Is that an operator? Is that a function call? It doesn't look the, like a function call, but. Which over there do you mean? I mean, anytime you use box. Oh, yeah. So um, Rust has this thing called a prelude. Uh, and so basically, at the top of every Rust program is assumed a uh, extern create standard and a use standard prelude v1 asterisk. And so the box type is a, u is a library to find type in the Rust standard library that's just imported in the namespace automatically by the fact that those two lines like appear basically in every single Rust um, file. So uh, box is a slightly special case in that it has a very tiny amount of compiler support still built into it, um, but it's 99% library defined and like 1% language defined. Um, one of the weird things about having a, a language that's as low level as Rust is that almost everything is defined in the standard library and not in the actual language itself. Um, and so box is, is no exception. Um, and so yeah, so it's, it's basically just a library type um, that yeah is is only in scope because of this stuff the standard library being in scope. So is there a way I could have my own like EOX or something like that which does something similar to boxing but something completely different and have that as a part of the code? Yes, you could implement you could take the code out of the standard library. So Rust is written in Rust, so you could actually like copy paste the code for box, change the name to something else and then use it and basically everything would work except for uh, the compiler support, if I recall correctly, basically boils down to, um, in the naive sense, this five would be allocated on the stack and then copied to the heap internally in the constructor, but the compiler support makes that magically be automatically allocated on the heap and not need to do the copy. And so your non-compiler supported version would miss out on that. You'd have one extra copy in there. But otherwise, you could write it yourself. Yeah, absolutely, and it would just work. Um, and the way that this basically works is, that's a good segue, I guess, into, so the, essentially, uh, one way of thinking about this concept of box is that uh, box has a destructor that basically calls free in the destructor on the value. So for those of you that raise your hand about C++14, box is basically unique pointer, uh, but a little bit better. The reason is, is that unique pointer with move semantics, if you move a unique pointer, it becomes 
hit null or the standard technically says like an undefined state. So you can still like get errors when you use a box if you move it because C++ is full of exceptions to every single possible rule that ever exists, <laughs> including the rules. Uh, so it's it's implemented as basically almost the exact same thing in the sense that like it's a it's a, a I don't want to say object type because Rust's OO thing is a little weird, but it's a wrapper type that basically calls uh, malloc in its constructor and calls free in its destructor, and then that just automatically manages the wrapping for you. Um, so, yeah. Uh, okay. Anything? Yes, what's up? Yeah, yeah. So, um, the question is, could you explain interior versus exterior mutability, um, which I will talk about like this. Okay, so I actually will get to that. I want to talk about this thread thing, and that's part of it. So we'll cover that in a second, because this threading thing is cool. Or do you have something? Because I, 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 I actually don't even know what the time is. Yeah. And, and I think we're all OK with that, because there's still a fair amount of engagement here. I just want to act, actually talk about some of the other features of the language and, and being expression-based things and, and, and strongly typed, things like uh, case statements and some of the uh, unusual restrictions on that and what that put, pushes down the programmer. Yeah. Um, and there's something else, but I'll, I'll try to remember what that is. But the case statement, I remember, being a very interesting experience. Yeah. Okay. I'll talk about match real quick, and then I'll talk about this threading thing, because the threading thing is so freaking cool, and it also covers the question about interior versus exterior mobility. So Rust does not have a switch case, but it does have match. And match is like switch case on steroids. Uh, if you've done functionally stuff, like we basically stole this directly from ML, uh, and other functional languages have a similar concept. Um, so if you've seen that before, it's not magical, but if you haven't, it kind of is. Um, so uh, what you do is you do this. You say, I'm going to match on some kind of value, and then you put in a number of things that have something over here, and then uh, a hash rocket, as we say in Ruby world. That doesn't cut on in Rust land yet, but maybe I'll try to make that catch on now. Um, maybe I shouldn't. Um, it's funny because there's an entire consultancy called Hash Rocket in the Ruby world, and then the newest version of Ruby like doesn't use the Hash Rocket anymore, and so there was this like existential ennui about like. Anyway, um, okay, so you have these cases where you have something on the left of the arrow and then a thing on the right of the arrow, and what happens is is match goes through and it evaluates each thing in turn, and then the first one that evaluates to being true, the thing on the right happens, and then the whole thing is done. Um, and this gets compiled down to a jump table usually, um, but that's sort of the basic concept of how this works. There's no fall through. Uh, what's up? Ranges? Yeah. Um, so that's, that's right what I'm getting into. Um, OK, so you can do all kinds of different things on this left-hand side of the arrow. So the simplest one is just like a value. Um, and I'm going to make these. I'll just do that. So a thing happens, which will be printing lol. Um, so you could do this and you know keep making these go on, but um, and this would match in any particular value if you wanted to. However, uh, that would be really really exhaustive, um, which is sort of a pun because the other thing is this code will not exactly compile uh, because non-exhaustive patterns. So one of the other great things about match is that match knows the type of the thing you're matching on, and it knows all the possible values of that thing, of that type. And so if you don't cover all of them with match arms, it will complain and say, hey, you're forgetting something. And this matters for another thing that I'll talk about in one second. But in this instance, it's like, hey, x is an, a 32-bit integer, but you only covered cases 1, 2, and 3. So you got a lot of things that are just going to be, you're going to totally miss out on. And so one of the solutions that you could do to this is use ranges. So I could say for, uh, from 4 to 100, uh, do this thing. Um, but that's still not everything. And so it would be super exhausting to have to go to int max. Um, so what you can do is you can do this underscore. And, uh, and the underscore basically says, like, I will match anything whatsoever. Um, and so this is kind of like the, the ultimate fall through case or whatever. Um, and so uh, this will now, Rust will let this compile because uh, you know, this catches every possible case. Now we've covered every possible kind of type, and we're done. And so you have to have it as the last one, right? Yeah, you would have to have it as the last one. If you put it, this compiles. Uh, no, it doesn't because I need triple dots because I'm terrible at syntax. Yeah, this works. If you put this above, 
It's going to complain that like uh, four to 100 is an unreachable pattern because it would hit the fall through case before the other ones. Can a variable can a variable be named underscore? Uh, yes. So you can name. So well, strictly speaking, no. Because what happens is, what happens is if you do this, uh, whatever. Oh no, the forbidden comment syntax. We don't use this block comment syntax ever, but it does exist. This will not. This will not name a value uh, underscore. This will. This is a pattern match against an empty thing, so it will immediately throw it away. So you can't like use this later. Like you couldn't then say like let x equals underscore plus one. Like like that doesn't work. This co this this code will compile. It'll just do nothing. Um, and this is useful because so for example, say I had a function that was returning a tuple of like. Uh, four things, but I only wanted the third thing. I could do like this, and then that would like throw away the things I don't want and only keep the thing that I do want. Will it be immediately dropped? Yes, it is immediately dropped. Um, okay. The, uh, so <laughs> yes. The let statement is like a pattern match itself. What, I'm sorry? The let statement is a pattern match in itself. Like, yeah, so like the left-hand side of a let is a pattern. And that's actually one of the reasons why I use the let key. People are always like, why can't you just say x equals 5 instead of let x equals 5? Why do I got to type let out? And it's actually because let supports full patterns on the left-hand side of the assignment. So uh, we call this like a destructuring assignment. Um, Funny enough, uh, function argument lists also support patterns on the left-hand side of the semicolon, which is why I could do mute x there, is because that's actually technically a full pattern that you can do whatever other pattern stuff that you want. Um, so yeah. Uh, the coolest use of patterns, and this is the last thing before I talk about this threading shenanigans, is Rust has no concept of null pointers or null at all in general, uh, technically. Um, we do have this thing called option. An option is a type that wraps other types that provides you the ability to say this may exist or not. So option is something that's provided in the standard library. Uh, it looks like this, uh, enum, and this is an enum, which is uh, similar to a struct, but a little bit different. Um, option t, so this is generic over any type t. You have some t or you have none. Um, and so I can wrap any type in this thing, and it gives you this, uh, this concept of nullability if you absolutely need it. But because it's a wrapper type, you're forced to deal with the fact that something is wrapped in an option before you use it. So you don't get in these situations where you accidentally dereference something that's null. Um, you know, uh, this is a thing that actually affects people in Ruby as much as it affects people that are in C, possibly even more because you're not usually used to thinking about it. But Rubyists get like called unknown method on nil like all the freaking time. Like I know that nil has the object ID of four in the Ruby interpreter because I've seen that error message so damn many times that like that's like yeah. Um, anyway, so the reason I bring up option when it comes to pattern matching is. So if I have some sort of optional value, so let's say sum five, um, then match lets me actually, uh, so when I match on x, I can match on sum uh, value v, and then none uh, this won't quite work yet, but I'll just I'll just leave it this. So so by using that destructuring aspect of the pattern, I can assign the value inside the sum to some value v, and then match on the none case and just print something out. But because Rust is expression-based, um, match is an expression. So the value that match, uh, the value of the arm, the thing on the right-hand side, right-hand side of the arrow uh, evaluates to is the value of the whole expression. So I can say like let number equals match. Um, and then, so I'm like unwrapping this value out of the sum. This won't compile because Rust will complain um, that the types are different. So, oh, no, it's not actually that. It's that I didn't use a semicolon here. Uh, so uh, match arm with an incompatible type. Um, expected some kind of type uh, that's an integral variable found an empty tuple, and that's because println returns an empty tuple because there's nothing to do here. So there's a couple different options I could take. Um, I could take the option of, say, just returning some sort of default value here that matches with the five. Um, I could also take the option of uh, uh, <laughs> crashing my process. Uh, 
uh, with a panic. So Rust does not have catchable exceptions, but we do have panics, which destroy the current thread and, and uh, cause it to unwind. So um, in if this particular implementation, I'm asserting that this value will always be some, and if not, my stuff is going to blow up. Um, and since panic is going to blow up, that unifies typewise, so this will actually work, even though it's not returning a value, because the only way the program can continue is if it gets on the sum arm, so this works just fine. Um, and everything else. So this pattern matching and expression stuff is super, super valuable. Um, this is actually so valuable uh, that it's actually a method. Uh, expect, nope. Uh, and so these two things are equivalent, um, basically. It's just a little utility function that's implemented on stuff. Um, yeah, so that's pattern matching. It is super, super cool and really useful, uh, and uh, certain kinds of problems are very, very nice uh, using this style of thing. Yes? So it seems like the default return type is an empty tu tu uh, tuple, but also there's a none type. Is there a distinction? Yeah, so uh, the empty tuple is this is just like, I mean, it's an empty tuple. It's like called the unit type sometimes. It's just uh, that, that nothing has happened. None is specifically like uh, a type that is used in this optional sum none sense. I mean, like semantically, they're both like nothing, but they're like different kinds of nothing. If that makes any sense at all, <laughs> my my English major brain is like totally. There's two kinds of nothing. That's fine. Um, but yeah, they're basically used for completely different purposes. Uh, like none is only used in the context of where there's a possibility of a value having some sort of value, but in this particular moment there isn't, as opposed to an empty tuple, which is really um, only used f to just sort of indicate that like this is not really an expression, uh, it's a statement, or um, sometimes it's used for functions that are only used to um, their, uh, for their side effects. So like if you're not returning something, you're just executing something for side effects, then that's an empty tuple. Um, so, okay, threading stuff, because I want to talk about threads, because they're so cool in Rust. Um, okay, so again, weird thing about Rust being so low level is that almost everything is in a library. So the standard library comes with an implementation of threading, but if you don't like it, you can write your own, and that's totally cool. Um, and because the safety stuff is in the type system, not in the implementation of the threading library, your own, my own special Burger King have it my way threading library can be just as safe as the officially standard library provided threading library. So you can actually get all the exact same safety benefits, um, even as an external library, which is super cool. Um, I'll talk about that in a moment. So to use threading stuff, um, I'm gonna bring standard thread into scope. So as I mentioned, some things are imported by default, what's in the prelude, but that's only a small amount of things, stuff that's used in basically every Rust program. Everything else you have to import directly, so um, standard thread. And um, uh... <laughs> so much punctuation. I gotta think about it for like one second. Uh, Okay, so this is a pretty standard kind of interface for um, threading stuff. So uh, the thread module has a function called spawn. You pass a closure to that function, and then it executes that closure in an external external thread, in a thread. Um, so this, uh, the syntax for closures, I didn't really talk about super explicitly. It's almost the same thing as Ruby uh, and Smalltalk. In Ruby and Smalltalk, you put these here, but in Rust, you put them here. I remember arguing about this, but I lost for some reason I don't remember, um, so it's slightly different. But the reason you have these double pipes is like if there was an argument to this closure, you would put them inside the pipes, basically. And then the curlies is the body. Um, is in this case, we're not taking any arguments. So, um, so thread spawn will then return a join handle, which you can call join on it, that will block until the thread is finished executing and joining. So. Um, so in this case, um, it prints out hello on the bottom there because it waited until the thread is finished. Uh, it complained uh, unused result, which must be used, uh, join on default. Join returns a type called result, and the result type is used to indicate errors. So uh, it's basically complaining like, hey, the join may actually fail, and you're not handling that error case, so I'm going to print out a warning. Um, and so we can do a couple different things to handle that error. My favorite thing to do in examples is call unwrap. 
Um, unwrap basically says if this is an error, just blow up the entire program and print an error message. Don't don't actually handle the error, uh, which is useful in these examples. But you can you can so you can use match as an example. Uh, so you can like match on join to then like uh, okay underscore good stuff happens and error something, an error occurred, or whatever, if you wanted to handle this error in a more appropriate way. But since we're just doing an example, uh, I'm just going to call unwrap so I don't get that error message anymore. Now, and I was talking about in terms of safety. So what's cool about this, we'll get back to our wonderful boxed integer on the heap. Um, if I were to say hello from a thread, and then I'm going to pass in this value of x. Um, so now this closure is closing over the reference to our heap allocated integer that we have, our box, um, in the main thread. And so uh, this is all totally fine and dandy, and this will in fact work. Or it will not work because I didn't actually. Right, it's still going to complain anyway. That's cool. So I was going to move this on the next example, but I didn't see why this wouldn't actually work in this particular instance, but it does. Close your mouth. Weird. I thought that used to work. What it's complaining about is, uh, oh, I'm an idiot. That's why I complained. Uh, it's, if I were to, I forgot to type out the example in the right way to introduce this concept in the right order. So uh, move says, well, I'll do it in that way. Since, since I already screwed it up, I'll just explain it this way. So the problem is, is that if I t give a reference into the thread in x, and then say I was going to try to print out the value of x here, or like do anything with it uh, at all, this would now n this would be safe because x is immutable, but. Um, because we don't know how long the thread lives, this could cause a use after free, right? So say, like, Rust is not smart enough. This is one example of where compile time analysis is not sufficient and where we have plans to improve in the future. But, you know, as always, you have to be more conservative to keep your safety. A human can see that we're joining on this thread before the function ends, and so x will always be valid. Um, but Imagine we had a scenario uh, in which this was not main, this was some other function, and if this was some function foo, uh, and this was not actually here, and I did something like uh, return the join handle, so this would have some sort of like returning the join handle, you know, I forget what the type actually is, it's just some long standard thread join handle crap onto it. This even without this println, this would cause this thread to have an invalid reference to x, because when foo goes out of scope, x gets freed, and now my thread has a reference to invalid memory. So that would be bad. So Rust's static analysis is not able to tell the difference between this example and the previous example I showed you where we joined automatically, because, uh, because it's implemented that way. I can't really get into the details at the moment. But you're just like naturally conservative because we want to promote safety above all else. Yes? Uh, is X and JH have the same scope? Will they go out simultaneously? So if I'm returning JH, though, so in this, in this modified example, I'm returning JH back to the parent. So you'd be right, yes, normally. Um, OK. So that's what that's basically what Rust is complaining about is like, hey, this thread may outlive this this uh, value x, so you can't do that. Um, and so the solution, the solution to this particular problem is to write this annotation move here. And what move says is basically anything that this closure references, I want to take ownership. I'm going to, to going to steal that the ownership over that thing. And now I'm the only one that's allowed to have references to it, and therefore it, this is okay. And so now this should actually be fine. Yeah, hello from a thread five. And so we've we've told Rust anything that the, anything in this thread's or this closure's environment is now moved out, and so you're not able to use it anymore. And the problem is, well, not the problem, but sometimes you need to be able to do stuff like this. And so if I wanted to print out this value here. Uh, the problem is that I've now moved this into the thread, and so this sort of introduces the opposite problem. Like, now that the thread owns this value, if the thread finished executing before, like if we did this, 
then this would now be invalid because it's taken the ownership and it's freed it already. So this would now be a use after free. And so Russ rightly complains about this with a similar use of move value x, uh, that one. Um, this is not possible. Um, and so in a certain sense, this is really, really annoying. Uh, in another sense, this is really, really wonderful because like, I didn't need to run some sort of race detector software. I didn't need to like, uh, run and analyze this code at all. Uh, the compiler is actually able to tell me, like, hey, you have some sort of threading problem here that this is going to make this not cool. And so this saves you all kinds of time. I'm now, I was always scared to write multi-threaded code in other languages, but now I'm like triply scared because I'm so used to leaning on the compiler to help me out with these safety things that I feel like without my training wheels on anymore, I'm just like ex exceptionally terrible at writing multi-threaded code. So the problem is that sometimes you do need to legitimately do this though, right? So how do you actually do something like this? And basically the, the answer is reference counting. So instead of taking a regular box, um, uh, yeah, thank you. I was like, I know what this is. I'm like, I'm like thinking of the core one and not, yeah, thanks a lot. Um, so, Instead of using a regular box, if I use an arc, so arc stands for atomically reference counted. So this is a box that has one extra word allocated with it that is an atomic integer. So that integer keeps track of the number of references that you've handed out to this particular thing, and uh, it allows you to um, like keep track of that count. And so what happens is is that I say like I'm gonna I'm gonna use underscore. Well, I'll just use y whatever. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, I actually don't think I even need that clone there. Yeah, five and hello from thread five. So this now works, and the reason why is that arc contains a method called clone, and what clone does is it bumps up the reference count by one, and then hands you back a reference to the thing inside of its box. So now, so um, originally, Excuse me. We had an arc um, with a count of one because there's just one that exists. Uh, clone bumps that up to two, uh, and we assign that that reference into y. Now our thread captures y, so y moves into that thread, uh, and so then when the thread is over, it will drop y, which drops the reference count back down to one, and our value is still uh, alive for a println um, in x. And then after the thing is over, x drops out, the count goes down to zero, and then it's deallocated. So this gives you this reference counting semantics instead of the strictly single owner semantics um, that you would have had uh, with just a plain old box. Yes? Can it capture cycles? It cannot capture cycles. Uh, there is a weak pointer that you can use that works with arc like that whole jam, but um, it is, there is there's no cycle detection because basically that's a terrible garbage collector and it means a runtime and paying for all that stuff, which you know we can't really do. Um, so it's true that it is dangerous, and that actually matters because of reasons. But yeah, <laughs> there's a long. We had a massive scare about the soundness. Some people were unnecessarily scared about Rust's soundness right before release because you could put a join handle from a thread into an RC cycle and then leak it, which would then cause memories on safety, which is like the most absurd, no one's ever gonna do it in real life kind of thing, but people were like panicking and like it was, it was a mess. Does the clone clone the reference counted object or the thing inside it? It, it creates a new reference and it bumps the reference count. It doesn't really like copy any memory. It like makes a new pointer. Um, it's called clone because usually clone does make a copy. And since this is like logically making a copy, you know, in a sense, we gave it the same interface, but it's not actually like, copying the underlying memory at all. Um, that's a good question, thanks. Um, I mean, they're all good questions, but that was a thing I should have mentioned already. Um, Okay, one other cool thing is this is an atomic reference counted type, but Rust is also smart enough in terms of safety that there's also uh, there's a non, there's an RC type that is just reference counted. It does not use atomics because atomic instructions are significantly more expensive. And so if you're operating in a single threaded context, you don't actually need the overhead of atomics because the atomics is only there to help you whenever you're doing multi-threaded stuff. So if you want this kind of semantics without the multi-threading, you can use RC instead of ARC. But here we're using multi-threading 
Uh, but we're going to use this regular old RC, and so that should cause races between incrementing and decrementing the count. So luckily, Rust is smarter than that, and it gives us this kind of crappy error message. Um, it's not great. Uh, the trait core marker send is not implemented for the type alloc RC RC32, and so um, the note is significantly better than the strict error message. RC I32 cannot be sent between threads safely. So we actually have this, this thing called a marker, uh, and this particular marker is called send. There's a couple different markers. And those markers are sort of like uh, they're traits, which I haven't really talked about yet. Um, but they let you annotate types with other properties. And so the send trait says this is OK to send references to other threads. So because arc uses atomics, it implements this marker. But RC, which does not use at uh, atomics, does not. And so Rust will actually prevent you from using an unsafe library uh, in a th threaded context, which is super cool. And this is also what I meant by uh, you can get the same safety when you write your own threading library, because you can basically say that my thread spawning function only takes things that implement this marker, and now you have the same compile time safety guarantees that everybody else does. Yes? So in the example you had up a minute ago, um, you use clone, and that looks cool. Mm -hmm. um, what if you need, so how does, shared memory between, if two threads want to actually share the same piece of memory for like inter-thread communication. Yeah, yeah. This is pointing happen? to the same place in memory. So the, 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 the clone, in this case, uh, Y and X are both like, well, they're both pointers to a multi-word pointer that's pointing to the same memory location. Like it's not actually copying the underlying memory at all. It's just making a new reference. Got it. Yeah. Um, and, uh, so yeah, so this so that we have the system that ensures the thread safety stuff, and it's all built in the libraries, and so you can like guarantee that you're using only thread safe stuff across threads, which is super cool. Now the other thing, I'm going to finally get around to this question about interior versus exterior mutability. Um, I didn't forget about you; it just took a while to get there. Um, so arc, uh, as I told you before, right? Aliasing and mutability are problems. Uh, so if we have aliasing, we can't have mutability. And a reference counted type is inherently about aliasing mutable memory. As we just talked about, this is literally two pointers pointing to the same bit in memory, right? So if I needed to, say, update the value of the box value inside of the thread, I would have a problem. Because this is only an immutable um, x. So for example, if I want to say, like, like I did before, uh, plus equals 1, this will complain, cannot assign to immutable borrowed content because uh, it's immutable. So what do we do? So this gets to this concept of interior versus exterior mutability. So everything I've talked to you about is, is sort of uh, exterior mutability, uh, but types Types can be mutable on the inside, but pretend like they're immutable on the outside, which sounds kind of insane, but the, the example will make more sense of it, I promise. So what we need is another thing from standard sync, which is mutex. And so now that we have an arc and a mutex, when we call x.clone, we're getting a reference to this mutex. And then on the inside here, we can say let value equals what? Sorry, y dot uh, lock. I was just like, I'm super spacing out on the name of this method. Uh, and now, this I think works. Let's ask the compiler if it works. It does not work. Uh, oh, it's, it's because I have a mutex now, so I do need, oh, oh. I do need to actually, um, I also need to acquire the lock there, and then, yeah, right, and then, and I also need, oh, I also need to do this here. This is, <laughs> the bad part about static types is like, where is this, where is that type that I just, yeah, Core result result standard sync mutex mutex guard standard sys common poison poison error standard sync mutex mutex guard cannot be formatted with the default formatter. Who knew? Um, <laughs> uh, it's still complaining because this is still the mutex guard. Whatever. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna do this. This is fine. This will just this will print. Uh, oh, because this is still not temporary. I'm just trying to print out this thing. I don't really care that much. 
No? Oh, I can't do that either? What is going on? I still have to deref it because, yeah. So as I mentioned, the freaking println usually auto derefs, but apparently I'm going to add parentheses for extra clarity. But yeah, because of, because of deref shenanigans, I need to explicitly deref the mutex. Cool. So now, as we can see, the main thread runs first in this particular instance, and we print out a five. But then inside the thread, we've updated that to six. And so part of that struggle that I just showed you is like very real in being a Rust programmer. People like to call it fighting with the compiler. I prefer to call it having a friendly conversation with a compiler. <laughs> because really, the compiler is there to like help you out. right? Like The thing that I was trying to do was terribly wrong. And rather than let me do something that's wrong, like a good friend who cares about my moral upstanding, the <laughs> compiler says, hey, Steve, I'm not going to let you do that wrong thing because we're good friends, and friends don't let friends do things that are wrong. Um, so mutex is a type that has what we call interior mutability. And, and the reason is, is you, if you think about a mutex, having a mutex itself, it appears immutable until you acquire the lock. And then the lock returns a value that's mutable to you, right? So it's like holding a mutable value, but it doesn't just let you mutate it willy-nilly. It only lets you mutate it if it knows that it's a safe thing. So you can implement Rust types that have this kind of thing. And so mutex is an example of uh, interior mutability in that sense. So what happens here is we have this mutex inside of our arc. Uh, we call clone to bump up that reference count by one. Inside of the thread, uh, we then call the lock method um, on that mutex. Um, and uh, the reason that it's called on the mutex instead of on the arc is because since arc is a smart pointer, if you call any methods on the arc and it doesn't have that method defined on itself, it will call it on the thing inside of it because that's really mega convenient, basically. Um, and so we call lock on this mutex, which uh, then blocks until it acquires that mutex. Uh, the unwrap, as I mentioned earlier, is because technically the mutex could be poisoned, in which case that will fail. But this is an example, so I'm just going to say, whatever, crash the program if that's not true. Uh, and then that gives us this value out of it. Uh, we increment the value by one, and then we print it out. And just in the same way that box deallocates its memory and arc decrements the reference count, the lock is unacquired when value goes out of scope because you don't want to be able to use value without the lock, and you don't want to be able to acquire the lock until value is gone. So you don't actually need to call on lock itself. It just handles that for you when it goes out of scope. And then down back in the main thread, we have to acquire the lock to print out the value inside of x, and we join. Everything is super wonderful and happy. Y yes? It's understandable why you need to acquire lock for immutable values, but why you need to acquire lock for print ln function because it's non-immutable? Because while I have the lock taken out on that value, I am updating it, right? I have the possibility of mutation. And so if I'm observing that value while I may or may not mutate it, that's a data race. And so that's OK in this particular instance, but like in a general instance, that leads to bugs and problems. Yeah, but on the other hand, they very often will lead to serialization. So in, your case, in this case, essentially, you have to serialize the things. Is, it, is there any kind of mechanism to uh, carefully thread these waters and try to print without acquiring the lock? Yeah, I mean, if you want to. If you want to do that dangerous thing, you can get into unsafe code, which I will talk about. I have slotted to talk about after this example, so I'll get into it. There's Rust always has, I've said asterisk a couple times, and then said I'll get back into it. Rust has this concept called unsafe, which basically lets you break literally all of the rules. Um, and so you can always do it. It just depends on how gross you want to feel afterwards and how many showers you want to take. <laughs> yes? If, so this looks like it's of the auto Unlocking of locks is awesome. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. That's a very coarse grain lock. I assume you can manually unlock things you have locked to get more fine grain locking. So now I've made a new scope, and value will go out of here, and now the lock will get unlocked. And so I can do other stuff in the function afterwards, basically. Like, just the easiest way is just make a new inner scope. Um, there is there a costs thing. To that though? Not really. Only in the sense that the mutex gets the like. There's a cost in the sense that your code looks a little more complicated, but there's no real like runtime cost to that. Um, it just gets deallocated. Now there is there is a thing that we are going to be implementing sometime soon that I don't know if it helps in the mutex case, but it basically. So right now this system um, of knowing when something is borrowing is entirely based on lexical scope. 
Uh, and so we're doing something that will move it to being based on the actual control flow graph instead. And so once you don't use it anymore, we can immediately deallocate the resource or whatever afterwards. But that requires a whole bunch of compiler refactorings to actually accomplish in the first place, and also language design to make sure that it's OK. So we do have some like more advanced stuff coming. Right now, the advantage is basically the rule is dumb, simple, lexical scope. But that also means you get in awkward situations like this, which is like not ideal. Deal. The, so the future will be like more complicated rules, but more intuitive to actually use, which is, you know, a trade-off that everyone else seems to think is good. I'm like 50-50 on it. I don't know. Yes. So if the mutex appears like a um, an immutable object, do you still need arc? So uh, yes, because. Uh, Mutex only works in the sense that it, I mean, it only gives you that mutability, but it doesn't give you the reference counting behavior, which is what we need to guarantee that the two threads, the main thread and the spun up thread, right. but have you it for the use length RC? of time. Huh? Couldn't you use RC? RC is not thread safe, so we couldn't use it to like use in the thread because it doesn't have the atomics, so it's the the safety count. RC and ARC are literally the same exact thing, except for ARC uses atomic reference counting, and RC does not use atomic reference counting. So if you're in threads, you need to use ARC, not RC. Right, but RC with mutex would give you Thank no, you. because the, the race condition is in the, the reference count. So like the not in the acquiring the mutex. You're right that like the inner value would be fine, but I could get in a situation where my value never gets deallocated because it bumps it up or down one too many times because of the race. Yeah. That's a good that's a good question though. All right, one or two more, and I'll talk about unsafe. So uh, with the locking stuff and the mutex, is there any concept of reader versus writer. So like, for yeah. example, if you have multiple readers, yes. you don't want to block all mm -hmm. of them because they're not updating the values. Right. So there is, uh, there are more specific and exotic concepts in the standard sync library that you can use instead of mutex. So for example, there's a RW lock, which does not make you take out the lock to do, it basically does the same thing with like N readers or one writer but it only makes you take out the lock for the writer case. And if there's readers, you don't need to take out the lock. But if there's a reader, if there's a writer currently writing, then it doesn't let the readers do any accesses. So you can like implement whatever those strategies make sense for your particular case. Um, and there are more complicated ones we've already implemented. OK, so oh, one more thing. Yeah, totally. So uh, I saw the option type. And so and then there's some mapping and stuff like uh -huh. Does, um Kind of like Haskell has that do, no, do notation? Yeah. Like shortcuts? So right? that requires higher kinded types, which we don't have yet. So uh, that is something that I personally want very much. Do notation, um, so there's, there's, a, there's a significant group of people in the Rust world that don't think do notation will work once we do get higher kinded types. I don't understand what their argument is, so I'll just tell you that I think it will work wonderfully and I hope we get it. Um, but I don't remember, I don't remember specifically what their, I th their argument is something like, but that doesn't work with imperative code. And I'm like, but that's not imperative code. That's the point of do notation. And like, I, I don't, I don't remember specifically. There's, we, we don't have higher kind of types yet. We have something very, very close to higher kind of types, but not totally exactly there. And we will be implementing higher kind of types at some point. But um, it's, it's like a medium, a medium wanted feature. Because once you have higher kind of types, people start using the M word. Monad. And once people start saying monad, people start getting scared and run away. Um, that's not entirely what it is. So one good example of where higher kind of types would be very useful is you can't write a function that can take either an arc or an RC right now because there's no like unifying super type. And higher kind of types would let us do those kinds of things. Um, and so that would be very, very useful. Um, but they also let you, that's like, that's like the, the step off point into like you are doing a really advanced type system instead of just like a medium complicated type system. Um, which is, a, I don't know, maybe that's a bad characterization, but um, okay, so unsafe. As I mentioned, Rust is written entirely in Rust, uh, almost entirely, basically entirely. Uh, there's some assembly code that you know you need uh, for the runtime, but. Um, so ARC is implemented and mutex is implemented entirely in Rust code. And the problem with that is that I've like already told you that like you can only have one, you can't have alias pointers to a thing, but like ARC gives out multiple alias pointers to a thing, right? So that's like contradictory. Um, and basically the way that that works is 
Rust has this thing called unsafe. What it does is you do this. And inside in here, who knows? Um, <laughs> which is not strictly true. Um, so unsafe, uh, we, we allow you to break the rules of Rust inside of an unsafe block, but with some caveats. So the first one is um, unsafe does not actually change the value of, it doesn't change the semantics of any code that you have uh, in existence. It doesn't, like, it doesn't like turn off the checks or anything. The checks still happen. Um, there are three things that unsafe lets you do. Uh, the first one is call unsafe functions. So certain functions are unsafe function foo, like this. And so if I add that unsafe before the fn there, uh, the only time I'm allowed to call this function is if I'm inside of an unsafe block. Uh, the most common example of an unsafe function is if you bind to a C library. Somebody asked earlier about calling C libraries in Rust. That C code could do literally anything that it wants. So every binding to an external function is automatically unsafe by default, and therefore you must only call it inside of an unsafe block. Um, the second thing that is unsafe and always unsafe is this thing called, oh, if I could type it anyway. A static mutable variable. So Rust, Rust, Rust has global variables, but they're a giant pain in the ass to use, which is really nice, because you shouldn't really be using them very much. Uh, and so a static, a plain old static value, totally fine, safe, don't worry about it. It's not mutable. But a static mutable, fun a static mutable value has all sorts of possibilities for data races and all sorts of weird threading problems and all those things. And so reading or writing from a static mutable value has to be done inside an unsafe block because you're basically playing with fire. Um, updating mutable state globally, terrifying. Um, the final thing that unsafe, so well, I guess, yeah, there's three things. So calling an unsafe function, um, using uh, a static mutable, using or updating a static mutable thing, and a last thing that I'm totally drawing a blank on now. Uh, pointers. pointers. There is a special pointer type called a raw pointer. Um, it looks like this. Uh, this, this and its, its partner in crime, Mute five. Uh, these are basically the exact equivalent of C pointers in Rust. And so uh, creating them is fine, doing stuff to them is fine, but dereferencing them is unsafe. Because you can't really like cause problems by like messing with a pointer. It's only at the point when you read from it that there's actually a problem. Um, and so those are the three things that you can do inside an unsafe block. Call and save functions do static mute stuff, and dereference these, these uh, raw pointers. And so the static mute thing, OK, that makes sense. Unsafe function, um, first of all, because of FFI, like I mentioned, also there's things like compiler intrinsics. So for example, we have a general casting mechanism called transmute that basically just says, like, please treat this type as this other type, and like, don't worry about it. Uh, and that's like the, the big hammer of casting. And that can be very dangerous. So that's as a compiler intrinsic, it is unsafe. Um, and then this, this raw pointer shenanigans, um, it does not have any of those like automatic safety guarantees about being valid or being invalid or all that kind of stuff. And so using that is terribly unsafe, and so you have to do it inside of an unsafe block. Yes? So for Rust uh, containers like vectors, does Rust do always the bound checking? Yeah. So, uh, so the answer to that question is like technically yes, but no practically. So I'll talk about the bounce checks in, in just a second. Um, I want to finish this mini unsafe thing. Um, the other thing that's really important about these unsafe blocks is that they should, while you can violate Rust's invariants inside of them, you're expected not to. So an unsafe block is safe to use. So for example, if I want to make a safe wrapper for this foo function, uh, I would make, like, I'll just call it foo2 because whatever, I'm not coming up with a real name for foo on the top of my head. Oh, I can't type. And like, maybe maybe it's because this takes some sort of argument uh, that I need to make sure has some sort of, you know, or whatever it is. Uh, and so I do some safety checking here. 
or whatever. Like it's intended to be um, uns it's intended to be safe to use this thing. And so this is the way that unsafe sort of works in Rust: is that you use unsafe when you're implementing the details of a library that's doing something dangerous, but you expose a safe to use interface. So the practical end of this means that if you're writing an application in Rust, you basically shouldn't ever use unsafe ever. So Cargo, for example, the like whole package manager thing, it doesn't use any unsafe code at all. Some of the libraries that it depends on do use unsafe internally, but it's in 100% safety stuff. And so what this lets us do is this lets us isolate the things that are truly dangerous and um, annotate them so that if your Rust code ever seg faults, you know that it's somewhere in an unsafe block, and that significantly cuts down on what parts of your code base you actually have to analyze to figure out where that problem actually is, which is on its own just like a big great benefit from the other default, which is like everything is unsafe, and if you do things okay, then there's a problem. So, um, so this is sort of the reason this is here, and in a systems language, you kind of always have to have this unsafe escape hatch, right? Because like, if you want to write things like kernel drivers, they're just inherently not going to be safe. So like, you have to have some mechanism to break the rules in a limited fashion. Yes? So I have a question that's not related to syntax. I'm curious why Mozilla created Rust in the first place. Are they using it for anything, or do they have any plans to use it for anything? Yeah, totally. Let me do that right after this vector thing. Um, Okay, so vectors. Uh, all right, so. Uh, if I do this, access the zeroth element of a vector in Rust, so like a vector is a list of values, this will be bounce checked at runtime, and it, and it, will, it will run. Um, however, uh, there are two reasons why this isn't a big deal in practice. The first one is uh, LLVM is magic. And so I'm actually not entirely sure that this will end up being bounce checked, because I think that LLVM knows that I'm using zero, and it knows that I've initialized it to at least those things. And in the limited instances, it's able to hoist that bounce check and like not deal with it. But I'm not 100% sure, because I am terrible at reading assembly code. But in some instances, LLVM will just straight up save you when it proves that it can save you. The other thing is that Indexing an array randomly is significantly less big of a deal in Rust because usually you will use iterators. So for example, where you would normally do something like for whatever and then inside the loop do you know, v of i uh, in a language like C, in Rust we do for i in v, uh, I'm actually ampersand v uh, println I. And so because the iterator here uh, handles checking that uh, you've done it in bounds, this will not do a bounds check on each individual access. It will do one check to make sure that you're not done with the loop, but that's it. So in real Rust code, most bound checks are eliminated through the use of iterators anyway, um, basically. But if you do random access, you will get a bounds check on them that LLVM may or may not optimize out, basically. So that's sort of the, the deal with bounce check stuff. What is the meaning of the exclamation point? What is the meaning of the, ah, uh, the exclamation point. That is a very good question. So okay, so I did this vec thing, I did this println thing. Um, Rust has macros, and by macros I mean like Lisp style macros, not like pound define style macros. Um, so they're based on ASTs, not on textual substitution, and when you call a macro, you use the bang afterwards to indicate that it is a macro. And there are two reasons for this. One is for humans and one is for computers. The first one is for humans, and that is uh, there is arbitrary syntax possible uh, inside of that macro thing. Uh, and so you want to be, indicate that like some weird stuff is going to happen and it's like not necessarily normal Rust things. The other one is that for computers, when you're parsing arbitrary syntax weird things, it's not totally arbitrary, it's going a little far, but like there's significantly, you can do stuff that's not strictly valid Rust code. So for example, there's a, somebody wrote, shared a macro today uh, on one of the communities that was a hash map bang. And so what that lets you do is that lets you do like uh, x5, y6, uh, like this, 
And so this is not really valid Rust code. We're able to write a macro that can parse that and then turn this into a hash map automatically. So, so the bang let the parser uh, just skip over until the end delimiter and not need to worry about what's on the inside of that stuff and it just passes it off to the macro instead. So it's, it's simultaneously like f to make parsing easier for humans and for people basically. But that's what it means is it means you're calling a macro. Um, yes? I couldn't quite hear the T, what specific part of, you were like saying that C++ has a simple syntax for. Yeah, yeah, so like there's a list of initialization syntax that's got like curly stuff. I'm like sort of familiar with it. Basically, uh, we didn't want to privilege a ton of uh, particular library types, so we only made a very limited number of macros to do those kinds of initialization things, and if there's high demand for other ones, then we will add them, but we're sort of playing it lazy um, at the moment. So we're running out of time now. Yeah, I was gonna just say that we are getting to what would be a good time to end, but I don't cool. know how you're feeling about how much you'd like to discuss, but I just wanted to ask uh, if you could uh, add to the why Rust sort of title uh, the things that you see people doing, like uh, Brian's question about yeah. what Mozilla is doing, may maybe what you see people doing, you yourself are doing, things like that. That sounds like a good wrap up, totally. And I will be happy going to the pub where I guess we're all going afterwards and we can talk about whatever, and I have my laptop so I can show you things. Um, Okay, so this like why Rust? Um, so Mozilla has been invested in Rust because basically uh, C++ is about four, sorry, Firefox is about four million lines of C++ and Firefox keeps on having vulnerabilities and tons of other problems due to the fact uh, that C++, <laughs> basically, for various reasons. Um, lots of them just due to the fact like, I hate to, I don't want to trash on C++ because its commitment to legacy is frankly wonderful in the sense that uh, almost all C++ code co continues to compile throughout the ages, but that also means that like 20 years later, there's a lot of design decisions that you might make differently today. So uh, unfortunately those hazards uh, pile up in a, in a thing like Firefox, and so um, Mozilla is investing in Rust because it is also simultaneously building a new browser rendering engine called Servo in Rust at the same time. And so uh, that's like proving that they can write a, uh, not only a more secure browser rendering engine, but also a significantly faster one due to the fact that it is massively parallel by default, um, which takes advantage of the kind of threading things that I showed you to be safe while being parallel. Um, and so that's sort of the reason that, that uh, Mozilla is sort of investing in this long shot is that a web browser really, really needs speed and safety at the same time. Most languages give you one or the other. Uh, basically, none of them give you both. And that's what Rust is trying to do. Uh, and the downside, anybody that tells you that there's this trade-off and the trade-off doesn't exist is usually selling you snake oil. Uh, and so what I will say is that fight in the compiler thing that you observed a couple times there, that's the trade-off basically, is that Rust programs are harder to compile in the initial sense, uh, but when they do compile, they tend to work significantly better uh, than other languages that are sort of in this space. So um, in terms of why Rust, um, for me personally, it's because I love low-level programming, but I'm very forgetful and bad at details. And I would much rather have a computer. Uh, I like to say that compilers never sleep. Compilers never, uh, like, they're, they're always, they're like kind of right. They're, I can't tell you the number of people that have come into the IRC room and have said, I write C++ code like this, and it's completely safe. And the, the Rust compiler won't really let me write this code because it gives me this error. And I'm like, well, if you think about what that error is telling you, it turns out your C++ was actually terribly not safe. Like, it may have been safe for you in this instance, but it's not actually safe in the general case. Um, and so for me, uh, I like computers doing the drudge work of doing things like double checking my T's and I's being dotted and crossed, which may be too much analogy in one sentence. Uh, but I like having the compiler help me out. I like doing low-level programming. And so to me, that's what's wonderful about Rust. Um, Finally, things like tooling, and I also didn't mention the wonderful community. Uh, we literally, I, I'm on the community team, so I'm slightly biased, but uh, there was literally an article in InfoWorld yesterday that was called Two Reasons Why Rust Will Succeed, and the first reason was technical excellence, and the second reason was a wonderful community. 
and they were like, the fact that Rust people are super nice and helpful is like weird in programming languages. And thinking about the fact that that's weird kind of makes me feel weird. But like, uh, yeah, so we, we sort of as a group uh, are happy to help anyone who is interested in learning both systems programming in general and also Rust specifically. And that's also, I think, a great strength of the Rust community, uh, generally speaking, as well. Um, OK, one last thing, and then we got to go. Yeah, Swift. Which is sort of a flavor for Rust. Right. So Chris Latner um, actually said that Rust is the largest single inspiration for Swift outside of Objective C, and uh, there are a lot of similarities between the language in a certain sense. Swift is also hobbled by its own form of backward compatibility, which is basically the Objective C runtime and Objective C itself. And so I think Swift is a fantastic language um, if you're willing to pay for its particular kinds of trade-offs. But for example, its pervasive use of reference counting everywhere, even when you don't strictly necessarily need it, uh, means that it is not ever going to be as like ridiculously low level as Rust is. Um, however, that doesn't mean that it's a bad language. It's just got different kinds of trade-offs. So um, I think Swift is cool. I, I want to see whether or not Apple is serious about supporting non-Mac platforms or whether they're just like, you can totally support anything because here's this code dump and if somebody wants to maintain a Linux port, that's fine. Um, you know, because cross-platform things are really important. So I also want to see how that shakes out. That could be wonderful or could be terrible. It depends. Um, so yeah. All right. So we, so we have our six questions. You have your oh, six yeah. questions. Do you think you can ask six questions about your presentation or about anything you want? Oh, I didn't know. You said I was asking questions, but I thought they would be like prepare. I didn't realize that I had to come up with questions. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You said there were trivia questions, so I'm like, hmm. Okay. So about about. Uh, so so quick quick thing. Anyone just just raise your hand. We'll call. Not not now. We'll call on you um, after the question is asked. Raise your hands, and we'll uh, call. The, 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 right, and, and we'll try to call on you as fairly as we can. We've got three books, three vouchers, and you'll take your pick. Shoot. Okay. Um, let me. Oh, now I'm. What? What is the type in the Rust standard library that uh, introduces the concept of nullability? If you want it. I saw you in the back over here. Option. That's totally Option. right. Option. Great. Come up and take your choice. Sweet. Uh, okay. Five more. Question number two. Uh, Rust does not have switch statements. It has. I'm just match. Match. Totally Sorry, everyone correct. at the same time. I went for what I saw first. Uh, Rust imports certain types from its standard library into every Rust program by default. The name of that module is. No. Oh, wait, wait, guys, guys, no, just raise your hand because I'm going to call on him over here because yeah. I saw him first. He he did uh, say the right answer. Is the, pre oh. the prelude, which is. Somebody said V1, which is like technically kind of true. It's technically more true in a certain sense, but the prelude is like what? There's only one prelude right now. It's V1. So yes, I would say prelude is the right answer. Oh. That was that was him over here. The, yeah, that's great. Totally. Okay, that's what I thought it was. Yeah, okay, great. Good. Yeah, please take your choice from from the books. That was three or four over here. That was three, I believe. Okay. Uh, the URL of Rust's website is. I had well, it up there, but I didn't say it. Yeah, I saw. Uh, no, you put your hand down. Okay. That's totally correct. Right over here. Come, yeah, grab a book or an ebook. That's the domain name, but not the URL. Oh, God. Oh, come on. I'm even like an HTTP nerd, so you would think that if anything, I like should get that. Yeah, yeah, right. The browser fills that part in. Um, OK. And that means one more? Two, two more. Two more. I need to count so some sort of reference count joke. We have these, thing right, these things right here, the objects on the uh, shelf. Yeah, yeah. Um, Okay, what, uh, let accept what on its left hand side? Um, you in the black shirt? Uh, regular expression of some sort. Not a regular expression, no, but you're close. Uh, over here? A what? A, bind a binding? Pattern. A pattern. pattern, yes, a pattern is correct. All right. One book and one ebook left. One book and one ebook. And so what, one last question. One more question, because the one is being claimed. Yes. Um, uh, let's see. There was already a thing about cargo, so I can't ask that one. Um, this is hard. 
<laughs> what? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, that would also be totally fine. Strings. Um, yeah, when, uh, how long has Rust been in development? Uh, you in the blue shirt, sir? Yep. Come on, that was it. All right. Cool. Thank you, everybody. Come on over to Bloom's Tavern. We are all going to be going to Bloom's Tavern on 58th Street here between 2nd uh, and 3rd. Uh, see you afterwards. Mm -hmm.